Last week, when we talked about remote workers being called back to the office and how a lot of these people are facing some pretty difficult decisions of whether or not they should quit their job or sell their house that they bought for a loss, it was brought to my attention by one of my subscribers and to keep him anonymous, we'll just call him John. And he sent me a story about LendingTree because he works for LendingTree and LendingTree is one of these companies that is really starting to punish their remote workers, and this is how. So first of all, for those of you who don't know, LendingTree is a mortgage company. They write loans for people looking to buy homes. And for the longest time, LendingTree has been a very employee-friendly company, and he told me that they've always been about retention, wanting to keep their good employees around and uh, doing what it takes to make their employees happy, essentially. And so, but recently, there has been a little bit of a change of heart over at LendingTree to the point where during the last three months, they've turned pretty hostile towards their employees. And what I mean by hostile is that prior to the pandemic, so many of the higher ups at LendingTree were just praising how well people were doing, working from home, and just talking about how well it was working out and saying that people have been very productive and uh, this is just doing great for all of us. What happened was a lot of people at LendingTree, and it's not just LendingTree, a lot of companies that decided to let their employees work remotely, these people got offered these remote positions, they went out, they bought houses in areas far away from their headquarters of their office thinking that, you know, we're not gonna have to return to the office. But just like many other companies now, LendingTree is falling on some tough financial times. In fact, during the peak of the stock market run-up, their stock was worth about $400 a share. Well, now it's down to about 25. So that is a massive plunge in share prices. And like I told you guys last week, that if you work for a publicly traded company and you're not paying attention to the stock price, then you might not see these layoffs coming. But the thing is, if you watch the stock price and then you see what the company does, you're always gonna see layoffs come from these plummeting share prices. Now that LendingTree is in big financial trouble, here's what they're doing. First, they tried doing a hiring freeze, so no more new employees. That didn't work. Then they started performing layoffs and that still wasn't enough. So now they are still in trouble. And as if that wasn't bad enough, this is another one of these companies that leveraged all of the cheap money that was available when interest rates were practically zero. But here's the problem. A lot of these companies, they borrow money with floating rate debt. And as interest rates creep up, so does their debt obligation. So this company is in big trouble like so many others. Really everything that you can think of is just stacking up against LendingTree because you also have a huge decrease in the amount of people looking to buy a home and applying for a mortgage right now. So they're basically getting slammed on all fronts when it comes to their revenue. So the latest tactic is, hey, why don't we contact all of these people that we said are allowed to work remote and Tell them they have to come back into the office now because chances are it probably wasn't a written agreement like we discussed a couple of times before so you know we can do whatever we want we can require them to come back into the office three days a week and the idea here is that a lot of people are probably going to choose to quit and look for another job so that way lending tree doesn't have to lay these people off and the beauty of that for them is they don't have to pay unemployment benefits. So that is the exact tactic that companies like LendingTree and many others are using right now to force people into quitting their jobs because they know that they moved and you know selling a house right now, especially when you just bought one over the past year or so, you're gonna lose money. And a lot of people are probably not going to want to do that and would rather take their chances and find another job, which is perfect for companies that are hurting like LendingTree. In fact, there was another story from Realtor.com talking about how 12% of all full-time US employees right now were 100% remote and 28% have a hybrid schedule where they have to come into the office at least a couple days a week and then 
are fully in the office. So still, the lion's share of the jobs out there are in person, not remote. And the interesting thing about this Realtor.com article is they highlight right in here that a lot of companies are starting to take advantage of this tactic where they're calling people back into the office not because they actually want them to come back into the office but because they're taking the chance and basically betting that a good chunk of them will quit rather than come back and that's ultimately going to save these companies a ton of money right now because they did a survey along with this article and according to the survey many of the workers that they surveyed said they were more likely to search for a new job rather than sell their house because especially now if a lot of these people sold their homes they would need to sell at a loss now that home prices are going down hmm and this is not me saying this guys this is a study done from realtor.com confirming what we've been talking about now for months and people that do decide to go back to the office and give in to the employer not only are they likely to sell their home for a loss but they're going to get hit with a double whammy because when they need to buy a new place closer to the office it's going to cost more than the home they have right now more than likely and on top of that they're going to be facing much higher interest rates than they would have a year or two ago so these people are getting slammed from all sides if they actually need to go back to the office. And we already know that this is happening to John since he sent me this story. But if this is happening to you and you are someone in this position right now, let us all know how you decided to handle this. Are you selling your house and just giving in to the demands of the office? Did you quit the job and find something else? Let everybody know because I'm sure there's a lot of people facing this dilemma right now and any helpful tips on how others handled it can probably really help people out right now. Now the next thing is people need to really start paying attention to see if they have any pending fines or liens with their local town, city, government, whatever, county, because there is a new trend starting to tick up right now and this story here is out of Florida about towns and cities starting to foreclose on people that have unpaid fines or any type of liens right now. This one story that they highlight here is out of Fort Pierce, Florida. And the woman in this story inherited a house from her father. And it's a very old home, over a hundred years old. And let's just say it's probably not in the greatest physical condition. The house is totally paid off has been for a long time. Ever since she inherited this home, she's been living in it since 2017. But now the city of Fort Pierce is trying to foreclose on the property because of different violations like uh, not mowing the lawn and having an unsafe structure, not making the proper repairs to the home. And this woman claims that she had no idea that this property had all these violations. And it turns out that the fines for this property date all the way back to 2004. And it was determined she owes about $240,000 in fines to the city of Fort Pierce. And that's why they're looking to foreclose right now. Just like we talked about the other day with our friend Christian that had to pay this red light ticket from six years ago over in California. Now you have the city of Fort Pierce hunting people down for unpaid fines as far back as 2004, guys. That is before the last great financial crisis. Can you imagine that this property has been raking up these fees ever since then and no one knew about it? I don't really buy that. I'm sure that they did know about it and probably just ignored it. I mean, how can you not know that your property has all of these fines? The city's not sending them letters in the mail, letting them know like, hey, it's time to square up on this. But really the point here, in local governments and really all governments right now are looking at any way and every way that they can try to squeeze an extra dime out of you right now because these guys need money. And the attorney behind all of this, his name is Matt Weidner, or Widener, I don't know how you say his name. And the interesting thing is during the last recession, his specialty as an attorney was helping people keep their homes. And now he's flipped 180 and actually is working with local governments trying to get them to help foreclose on all these properties and help the cities collect extra revenue. And there's a big incentive for cities like Fort Pierce or really any city to hire someone like Matt because 
The thing is, he doesn't charge anything up front to perform these lawsuits and these foreclosures. He only gets paid once the deal goes through, the foreclosure was successful, he takes his chunk from there. So it's kind of like commission-based work. Because of that, I'm sure you're gonna start seeing a lot of local governments starting to jump on this bandwagon and start doing these type of foreclosures, especially if there's an army of attorneys out there offering free services up front. But before we call this attorney evil and he's you know, completely squeezing people out of their homes and all of this, let's at least look at the other side of the coin on what he said when he was interviewed about this. He said that his crusade here is the fact that there are billions of dollars that are owed to the taxpayers of these municipalities that's not being collected. The fact that Miami and all these places are not collecting this is one of the greatest examples of government mismanagement. Hmm. Now, when you look at it from that point of view, I say he actually has a point because look at the way that governments operate right now. They usually, instead of doing these foreclosures on people that owe all this money or whatever, instead, they ought to charge you and I more via raising your property taxes every year. Or if they need money, they'll issue bonds and you know have the city go into debt and have investors in the city and they, they pay off those bonds through extra taxes through that way as well. So you have all these cities and governments that have ways to tax people extra, but instead of taxing people extra, maybe they should be going after the people that aren't paying their bills, because that's what it sounds like they're trying to do with this. So let me know what you guys think. Do you think that uh, they're doing the right thing by foreclosing on people that have unpaid bills since 2004? Do you think they should just be getting the extra money through raising the taxes like they've been doing on everyone? Obviously guys, I never wanna see anybody get thrown out on the street, but if you're not paying your bills, then you, you deserve to get foreclosed. That's kind of how it works. If they don't do this, then you know we're gonna end up like California where people can live rent free seemingly forever. You know, you have people there that haven't been paying rent in three years and they just don't wanna throw people out because the homeless crisis is so bad there that that's going to just make it worse. But how is that the problem of people that pay all their bills on time? You know what I'm saying? So it's a tough argument, it's a tough problem to solve. I'm not saying there's any easy answers to this, just curious to know what you think. You don't see that every day. The old ice cream truck. I used to love that when I was a kid. I don't know if it's the same music, but it's cool that they still have that. <laughs> Anyhow, it was recently determined that there are only two cities left in the entire United States that first-time home buyers make enough money in the area where they can afford an average price home. And those two cities are Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Cleveland, Ohio. The average home in Pittsburgh is listed for about $214,000, which is only 2.6 times the area's medium household income of 82,000. So that's very affordable when you're looking at housing. And so many people you know, are saying that they can't find affordable housing anywhere anymore. Well, there's Pittsburgh and there's Cleveland, guys. In fact, in Cleveland, Average home there is listed for 199,000 and that's 2.9 times the medium household income for buyers there of about $69,000 a year. I still think that one of the issues when it comes to affordability is that people just seemingly don't want to live in the areas where housing is the most affordable. And that's one of the reasons why housing is so expensive in the areas that it's expensive because everyone wants to live there. It's a totally the opposite thing. This little story here is proof that there are some little pockets out there of affordability. So for people that want to be homeowners and that's your number one goal in life, maybe you gotta start somewhere and look at places like this. Because on the contrary to that, the least affordable housing markets are Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, Miami, and Las Vegas compared to what people earn, right? So you can't just look at these places like, oh, I wanna li live in Las Vegas or Miami or LA. Yeah, well, you and the rest of the world, and that's why 
things are so expensive in these areas. Now, many of you probably know that Credit Suisse was another bank failure that happened over this past weekend. And funny how all these bank failures are happening over the weekend when no one can really do anything about it. Funny, right? Hedge fund manager Nelson Peltz came out on CNBC and said that the federal government should expand its guarantee to all bank deposits regardless of the size in order to slow bank runs, but it should charge customers for that insurance. In fact, Elon Musk is on the same page with this guy because he came out recently and said that they should raise the FDIC limits to unlimited. So no matter how much money you have in the bank from now on, it will be covered by FDIC insurance. Well, it has to be paid for by someone, guys. So it's gonna be paid for by us, the depositors, okay? And basically, this proposal from Nelson is that you have the FDIC insurance up until 250,000, and then beyond that amount, the insurance premium that's paid would be paid to the Federal Reserve to have the amount that's covered in the bank unlimited. He says, I would put together a plan that applies only to U.S. banks and that the Fed gets an insurance premium for any money you leave in a U.S. accredited bank over 250 grand. So you're creating income for the Fed and in exchange for that, they insure the coverage. And he thinks that the fees for this should come out of things like the interest they pay you on your CD account, for example and that banks should be limited on how much cash they can accept to begin with from depositors. So there wouldn't be an unlimited amount that you could put in any given bank, which I think is a good idea to limit how much any one person can deposit in a particular bank, whatever that limit should actually be in order to be able to fully back up all of their depositors. But he's saying regardless of what happens, whether there's any more future bank runs or not, that they should be doing this in order to reassure customers and to secure the banking system before everything completely collapses. Now, I'm not sure how I feel about this. On the one hand, I think it would be good that we would have all of the deposits guaranteed from now on to basically prevent more bank runs. So that would be a good thing for our banking system altogether. But the problem I see with it, as usual, is who's paying for this, guys? You know, we are. So your premiums and the fees that your bank is charging you is ultimately going towards insuring rich people's deposits. Because let's face it, people that don't have a lot of money in the bank are the ones that pay the most fees in the form of overdraft fees, account monthly maintenance fees. Because look, most of the major bank accounts today, the minimum account balance for a lot of them is probably at least $3,000 that you need to keep in the account Otherwise, they'll charge you a 20 or $25 a month maintenance fee each month. And then if you go over, if you have an overdraft fee or anything like that, there's an additional fee. Oh, you need to uh, get a cashier's check. There's a fee for that. So there's a fee for practically everything with these banks. And people that don't have a lot of money are the ones that pay the most in fees and will ultimately be subsidizing the insurance policies for people that have a lot of money in the bank. So that's kind of my gripe with this and where I think it's just not right. So I definitely don't think that this idea is perfect, but at least it's kind of brainstorming on what maybe they should be doing in order to make sure that this entire system doesn't come down and collapse. You know, personally, I think they should just throw everything back on the gold standard while they can before the BRICS nations take over the world. But hey, I'm not in charge, so that's just my idea. But since we know they're probably not going to do that, they need to be looking at ways to protect people's money while it's still worth something anyhow. But really the biggest threat right now from the banking system besides more bank runs is a credit crunch that is very likely to come because if banks don't feel secure lending right now, then they're going to tighten up the amount of lending that they do and that's going to completely crash the economy, guys. Whatever is left of the economy that we have right now will be completely decimated when this credit crunch fully kicks in. Because if people cannot borrow to buy cars or buy houses or, you know, just finance a TV or whatever they want to do, then it's game over. You know, we're going to be plunged straight into a depression, most likely. We just saw a couple days ago that the European Central Bank, they went ahead with their half a point rate hike, regardless of what's going on here. And we know that this week it's all eyes on the Fed 
and hopefully they follow suit and do the same and move forward with their interest rate hikes rather than a pause right now which would probably be sending a very bad message to a lot of people if they were to pause at a time when inflation is still raging. And what are the potential scariest futures of the banking system right now, like so many of you mentioned in the comments, is the potential of a coming CBDC, or the central bank digital currency, which is a way for the government to completely track and control every single cent that you spend from now on. And that's not something that most of us want, right? Florida's governor, Ron DeSantis, just recently came out with a proposal to completely ban the use of any sort of CBDC here in the state of Florida. And the reason for this is to protect Florida consumers and businesses from the reckless adoption of a centralized digital dollar, which will stifle innovation and promote government sanctioned surveillance. And the proposed law would also prohibit in Florida the use of a CBDC issued by any overseas central bank and the governor's statement calls on other states to adopt similar legislation. And this comes after last year when Biden came out and approved the federal government to do a study on using the CBDC. And DeSantis also says that having a CBDC would not only destroy our privacy, but it would also destroy the local banking system altogether. Because if there were to be a CBDC, all these local banks and credit unions would pretty much go out of business overnight as they would no longer be necessary for the banking system. And guys, I love that he came out and said this because at least there is someone out there looking out for our future when it comes to this. And I don't care if Florida ends up being the only state where CBDCs are not allowed, at least there will be somewhere where the government cannot control every little thing that you buy. And I think more states are going to wake up and adopt something similar to this if they want to go ahead and push this thing forward. I mean, just look at Missouri. They're already looking at using gold as legal tender, okay? And you have the BRICS nations that are backing up their resources by gold and things like that. So I think you're gonna see a reversal in policies in places that realize that this is going to strip away whatever freedom we have left. I, for one, definitely never want to be using any sort of CBDC currency. If it means that you know everything needs to be traded in gold and silver from now on or Bitcoin or whatever else in order to prevent this, then I'm game because I think this whole thing is ridiculous and there should be no way that they should be considering this right now. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you click the bell notification down below. YouTube will alert you every time I post a new video. And if you don't want to wait, check out my next one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.